I'm going to get into the message here in just a minute, but right after the message, before the offertory, uh, we've got one more piece of special music that we're going to put in, and uh, we're going to hear O Holy Night tonight right after my message. So just a change in that, and so the ushers know it'll be right after that that we'll do the offertory. So, all right. Folks, we've been in a series all, uh, all season um, called The Christmas Touch, and uh, we're going to be talking about that a little more tonight. We're going to be, and I've, I've based it on characters of the Christmas story, and tonight, of course, is based on Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. But would you pray with me as we go into this time of God's word together? Let's ask God's blessing on this time. Gracious God, thank you so much uh, for this day and, and just for the privilege of being here in your house once again. And thank you, Lord God, for Christmas, just the gift of Christmas that reminds us so much of your incredible love for each and every one of us. Lord God, remind us too as we get into your word tonight just how much you love us, how much you care about us, how much you want to connect with us, and bless this time. Lord, I pray that uh, this preacher will not get in the way of what you have to tell us tonight, but that you will speak to each and every one of our hearts through your word. I pray this, Lord God, and we expect it in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, years ago there was a man who fell over. Uh, the edge of Niagara Falls, and I know you guys all know what Niagara Falls is, and, and he ended up clinging for his life on some uh, water-washed rocks below the falls, but separated from those, he couldn't even talk to them, who were above. They knew he went over, they could see him down there and so forth, but they couldn't communicate because of the sound. Bystanders threw him a rope ladder. They were hoping to get him out of there and hoping to rescue him off of those rocks, but when they threw that rope ladder down, it got hung up on some bushes that were just above him, so the ladder would not reach the man. And then those who were the rescuers, some of them, they asked for a volunteer. Can we please get a volunteer to go down, untangle this rope ladder, and then help this man up? And, and they got a volunteer to do that. And he climbed down and he untangled that rope ladder and he uh, uh, made his way on down to the man, uh, swinging and swaying above the raging waters there um, towards this helpless man. But he finally reached him and drenched and, and, and weakened this victim was that was hanging on for dear life down there, he helped him to the ladder, and he held the rope ladder taut while this man went ahead of him and made his way up the ladder. And onlookers, of course, worried uh, that the fatigued man lacked strength for the climb, that he wouldn't make it. But he finally reached the top, and he was pulled to safety. And then the courageous rescuer followed without incident. I tell you that short story as we begin tonight because, folks, that story describes very well just what God has done for us through the birth of Jesus, his son. Like that volunteer, he came down to rescue us from the mess that we were in, and that was separation from God. And so he came down to rescue us, and, and Jesus didn't just hold the ladder, by the way. I want you to know this, for he knew that we had no energy left to save ourselves, Rather, he gave us his strength, connecting us once again through all that he did for us to God the Father. So what does God deserve? That's what I want to ask you as we begin today. If that's the gift that we were given, a gift of rescue and a chance at life eternally with God, what does God deserve, you know, after giving us this most incredible gift, that rescue? Well, God deserves for us to come up to him in praise very much like Mary did, the mother of Jesus, who worshipped her Lord for keeping his promises to her and to all her people. And the message, folks, of tonight's scripture is just this. And I want you to hear this clearly. Mary gave back to the giver. Mary gave back to the giver the gift of praise. And we need to be doing the same with our lives. Let's take a look at Mary's story right now. You can follow along on the screen with me. This is from Luke chapter 1. And if you were here this morning, it's basically just a continuation um, in Luke chapter 1. But this is Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. This is the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Well, this says confused and disturbed, and I think I would be too if an angel appeared to me at any time. You know, it'd be one of those kind of events. But Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus 
he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she has conceived a son and is now uh, in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Well, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted then Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And of course, that baby in Elizabeth's womb was none other than John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. So then we come to Mary's song of praise. Mary responded, oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he, had, he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. And then it tells us Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home in Nazareth. Folks, I want to start here. you got a little outline in your bulletin there if you want to follow along. If not, that's fine too. But I want to just say this. There was praise in Bethlehem that first Christmas night. There was actual praise to God. This was their response. In the little town of Bethlehem, we see a, a somewhat odd collection of people celebrating the birth of Jesus, don't we? And this is kind of an unusual, I, we've never put these people together for any other reason. But there was the Magi who actually came later, but the wise men, they're a part of the story. With their gold and frankincense and myrrh, they brought beautiful gifts to this Christ child. There was then the shepherds. I mean, we're talking one end of the uh, spectrum to the other here. But then there was the shepherds right out of the fields and their encounter with this messenger angel and, and the angel choir. And then there was the God-fearing man named Joseph who was there and his Messiah-carrying wife. Folks, these were the people who celebrated Jesus from the beginning, the magi, the shepherds, and the parents. And the worship, even on that first night, had to be incredible. It had to be absolutely incredible, so much so that words cannot even capture it. And why do I say that? Because I believe this to be true. Worship needs to be experienced firsthand in order to be appreciated. And that's what you and I are doing tonight. We are worshiping together and experiencing that. Folks, all of those who made up that first congregation in Bethlehem, um, I'd like us tonight, out of all of them, to consider one. To consider one in particular whose joyful example invites us to come and adore him, Christ the Lord. Luke 2.19 tells us that after the shepherds um, had returned to their flocks, it says that Mary kept all these things in her heart. And she thought about them often. So what was Mary keeping in her heart here? Well, some think, well, maybe it was what, the, what the, the angels said to the shepherds, and the shepherds came and told her. But I'm more inclined to think that Mary was remembering what took place about nine months ago when the angel Gabriel appeared to her in, in Nazareth and the unexpected and unbelievable news that she had been selected to carry the Christ child. Boy, as a mother, who could be honored more than that? And now the fulfillment of that promise taking place. Or, or, or maybe she just thought that the one who would grow in her womb 
would be like no other ever born on this earth before and like no other man who ever walked the face of this earth. But how can all this be? That's what Mary was asking. I'm sexually innocent, yet I'm having a baby just as the angel had said. And then she remembered. She remembered the angel's words to her, and she remembered these words in particular when that angel told her, for nothing is impossible with God. And folks, as Mary pondered all of these things, she recalled God's ability to make good on the promises that he'd made. Everything had come to be just as the angel had told her, just as God had said. And now, nine months later, Mary has the satisfaction of knowing that her willingness to be available and usable and obedient had all been worth it. There was praise in Bethlehem that first Christmas night and rightfully so. God had blessed the world, folks, by rescuing it, which was the gift of his son. And folks, I want you to know this too, and Augie talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but God was blessed that night too. We don't often think of that side of the coin, but God was blessed too, because Mary gave back to the giver the gift of praise. There was a man who came up to a preacher after a, a, a worship service one, one Sunday, and And he shook his hand, and then he asked curiously, he asked this preacher about the meaning of that last hymn that they had sung. And the hymn was entitled, I Will Bless Thee, O Lord. And he said to the preacher, he says, you know, I can understand God bless me because we talk about, um, you know, how God can bless us. And, and, uh, but, but how in the world can I bless God? And the preacher replied in this way. He said, sir, do do you have any children? And the man said, yes. And then... He said, at Christmas time, did they ever give you gifts? And the man said, sure. That was his response. And then the preacher asked him, he said, where did they get the money from? Your kids? And he chuckled. And he said, well, I give it to them. He said, and then they bless me in the giving, don't they? And the preacher's response was, exactly. Folks, when we take the time to keep in our hearts what God has done for us throughout the years, when we keep that in our hearts and then take time to worship him, we are praising God with the blessings that he has already put in our lives. And that's just what Mary was doing. That's exactly what Mary was doing in our scripture for tonight. There was praise in Bethlehem that first Christmas night. And so I want to say this in response to that And then I'll wrap it up here pretty quick. But there should be praise in our communities too. There should be praise right here in these communities on this Christmas night as well. So where do we begin? How do we do that? Well, like Mary, by treasuring up, by holding in our hearts all that God's done for us. Then pondering that in our hearts. What the angel, and remembering what the angel announced to Mary, that nothing is impossible with God. Folks, no, it's not possible. It's not possible to earn God's favor by trying hard to please him. That's not what we're talking about tonight. You can't earn your rescue. But what is possible is this. With God, it's possible that there's a provision that we can be right with him. We can live a life of faith. And that's a gift that comes simply by simply believing in his son Jesus and allowing the life of this baby that was born 2,000 plus years ago to live in us. And that's how we do that. Perhaps you feel tonight like you've blown it. So often we come into church, even on Christmas Eve, and we feel there's no way God would ever accept me or use me or whatever. There's no way that that we could offer the kind of forgiveness to someone who treated us the way we've treated God over the years. But let me remind you of something, what the angel said again. There is nothing impossible with God. There is nothing impossible. That's what Mary heard. And that's what we need to hear tonight, too. That's what God's grace, folks, is all about. And out of that realization, when we know what God has done for us, our automatic response is praise, to come and thank God and to worship God in the midst of whatever we're going through. How in the world can we praise God in the midst of what some of us are going through? I don't know. For some of you, how would you describe Christmas right now? For some of you, it's pretty sweet. You can't imagine how it could even be better, could you? For some of us. For others of us tonight, I know that the word bittersweet may be a better word to describe Christmas this year, or maybe it's just plain sour 
right now. I realize that those are possibilities. How in the world can you give God praise in the midst of what you're going through? Just remember, nothing is impossible with God. And that includes touching your life with the grace to handle whatever you're going through right now. Folks, I'm going to take you back in history a little bit. This is my history. I realize this wasn't, I don't know, this sounds recent to me, but for some of you it'll be ancient history. But way back in, on Christmas Eve in 1973, um, in the midst of growing turmoil over Watergate, scandal, a troubled economy, and uncertainty over the future of the U.S.-Soviet relations, the co-host of a CBS news program called 60 Minutes. Anybody ever watched 60 Minutes before? I couldn't believe this happened, but, but he delivered this following commentary, and I'd like to close with this tonight. Here's what the co-host of CBS's 60 Minutes said back in 1973. He said, Christmas is such a unique idea that most non-Christians accept it, and I think sometimes envy it. If Christmas is the anniversary of the appearance of the Lord of the universe in the form of a helpless baby, it's quite a day. It's a start startling idea, and the theologians who sometimes love logic more than they love God find it uncomfortable. But if God did do it, folks, he had a tremendous insight. People are afraid of God, this commentator said. People are afraid of God and standing in his very bright light. But everyone has seen babies. They've seen babies, and almost everyone likes them. I know I do. So if God wanted to be loved as well as feared, he moved correctly here. This was the way to do it. And if he wanted to know people as well as rule them, he moved correctly. Because a baby growing up learns all there is to know about people. If God wanted to be intimately a part of humanity, he moved correctly. For the experience of birth and familyhood is our most intimate and precious experience. So it goes beyond logic. It's what a bishop I used to know called a kind of divine insanity. It's either all falsehood or it's the truest thing in the world. It's the story of the great innocence of God the baby. God and the power of man. And it is such a dramatic shot toward the heart that if it's not true for Christians, nothing is true. That's how important tonight is. So even if you did not get your shopping all done and you were swamped with the commercialism and frenzy, be at peace. And even if you're the servants in this church who've had to arrange for extra seating or do extra things tonight, to receive everybody at this very special service, be at peace. The story stands. It's all right that so many Christians are touched only once a year by this incomparable story. Because some final quiet Christmas morning, the touch will take. And folks, that commentary was written by one by the name of Cal Thomas. Anybody ever heard of Cal Thomas before? And I want you to know that's my prayer for you tonight, for each and every one of you this Christmas. Learn from Mary. Ponder all that God has done in your life and then give him the praise that's due. Give him your life that's due because there's no praise greater than that. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I just want to thank you so much for this evening. And I want to thank you for Mary's example. As simple as it is, Lord, she just responded to what the angel had told her months ahead. And into the birth of her son, she knew it was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that she was carrying. And her response was one of praise. And it's a beautiful example of how our, our lives ought to reflect what you've done for us, too. Lord, thank you for this Christmas Eve where each and every one of us can come into this place and we can offer you our very best. We can offer you our praise and thanksgiving. Our very presence, Lord God, speaks to that. So thank you for this time that we can give back to you. And we pray, Lord, just as Mary did for you, that you have been blessed by all that we have done tonight too. Thank you for this message to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>